Welcome everybody to this webinar about um, international case studies of integrated water uh, stormwater management. This webinar is organized by H2O Lyon. H2O Lyon is a graduate school of uh, watershed sciences in Lyon with a special um, focus on integrated and interdisciplinary solutions combining natural sciences, social sciences and engineering as well as practitioners. And um, it's co-hosted co by us, the students of the Master Integrated Watershed Sciences. Uh, my name is Leo, welcome. And um, can you see my next slide? Yes. Okay. Um, the webinar is part of the Water Week um, organized by H2O Lyon. There were already different events such as workshops and for example, on Saturday, all the people um, staying in Lyon, there will be an exhibition at the Musée de Confluence, a special exhibition um, about research in river sciences. Um, for that, I would like to invite you also. Um, in this webinar, we will have um, three different case studies from, um, from Colombia, from South Africa and from Germany as well as a conclusion um, from France. And we will start with Nestor Mansipe. He's a doctor in environmental engineering and he is currently the director of the master's degree in hydraulic resources engineering and a professor of the Department of Civil and Agricultural Engineering at the National University of Colombia, Bogota. And um, he will present us um, the topic or the the, the approach of sustainable urban drainage systems um, in Bogota with his vast experience of 17 years already uh, teaching and researching on this topic. Then we will have John O'Cody, um, John O'Cody, Doctor of Civil Engineering um, from the University of Cape Town. He's a senior lecturer and director of the undergraduate program and the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Cape Town. And um, his research is also done at the Future, Re Future Re Water Research Institute in Cape Town. And uh, he will demonstrate with different case studies um, how SUD contribute towards addressing the challenges of water scarcity in South Africa, including stormwater harvesting and urban cooling. Third, there will be Stefan Bandermann, um, who is a geographer and a project manager at the engineering office Storm, stormwater expert Sieger in Berlin, Germany. And Sieger engineers are like one of the pioneers in Germany with stormwater management. And they do uh, since over 25 years um, project management as well as research and development um, in the area of integrated stormwater management in Germany in Berlin, but also on worldwide. And he will present us a case study of integrated stormwater management of a building complex in the vicinity of Berlin. Then, um, Elodie Brulot, um, an expert in urban hydrology, will give a synthesis and um, the concluding report um, on the presentations, as well as uh, will contrast them with the Lyon uh, case study uh, from France. Um, she's the managing director of the GRE, the Resource Center for Water Management in the French territories, and also the organizer of the NovaTech, uh, which is an international conference on sustainable and integrated water management in Lyon, um, taking this year place uh, in the beginning of July. I will stop my presentation from now and I will ask um, um, Nestor Mansipe to present um, his presentation <laughs> and share your screen. Welcome. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Uh, please, would you confirm if, it's, if I'm sharing it? Oh, okay. Perfect. We can see it. Thank you so much. So uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm here to present an implementation of sustainable urban drainage systems uh, in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, my name is Nestor Mancipe. 
Uh, I will start the presentation uh, talking about Bogota. <clears throat> we are located in, in South America. Uh, we are over the tropical area, so we don't have seasons. Uh, the temperature rises as the elevation increases. Uh, Bogota is located uh, approximately uh, 2,600 meters above the sea level. We are considered a mega city uh, with over 9 million people. And um, the climate is, is cold, is dry. Uh, we have an average rainfall of 800 millimeters. We have uh, two seasons, one dry season and one rainy season. Uh, so we, are, we mainly have a bimodal hydrological regime. Temperature on average is 14 uh, Celsius degrees with uh, an observed maximum of 26. It used to be lower than that uh, many years ago. Uh, well, but we are uh, starting to face in, uh, some changes due to climate change. And the relative humidity oscillates between 79 and 83 uh, percent. Um, regarding the, the storm water and, and the urban runoff, we have many issues, um, especially uh, due to the increasing impervious surfaces. Um, here is a, a sketch of Bogota uh, in the top portion of, uh, of the map, we have a, a, a mountain uh, area. So the water flows from the, from the east to the west through these uh, blue lines that you may see here, uh, all the way down to the Bogota River that basically uh, conveys all the storm water from the city. Um, many studies have determined in Bogota, um, especially in the lower areas close to the Bogota River, that are the more prone to the flooding problems in, in a, due to the, the storm water. So uh, that's basically the, uh, the issue that we are facing. And uh, for many years, uh, we have uh, endured uh, many uh, uh, rainy seasons where flooding is, is actually becoming quite normal. So you may see here pictures from 2009 all the way to 2023 where uh, we are facing uh, urban flooding and uh, every year is becoming more frequent and more uh, uh, difficult to, to manage. So uh, many institutions in Bogota, not only uh, governmental institutions, but also academic and um, private sector uh, have been working on, on solutions. And uh, around 2017, uh, the sustainable urban drainage system is start becoming a, a very interesting solution uh, due to the fact that uh, these engineering solutions allow to manage the excess of runoff through natural processes. So um, the city is start working on five objectives to uh, improve the quantity uh, by reducing these flooding events, uh, uh, by also improving the quality of the runoff and uh, including some uh, amenity and um, planning and recovery uh, ecosystem services around the city. So the, the main objective of my presentation is actually to share the experience of the, the, the construction and operation of uh, what we call a knowledge network around these two uh, typologies in Bogota. This uh, network uh, knowledge is comprised by public entities, all the entities related with climate change, environmental um, agencies, uh, the public services companies, also uh, the entities that manage the public parks, uh, planning entities in the city, and also the botanic garden, <clears throat> which is in charge of all the, the vegetation in the city. Also, uh, there is um, several universities uh, among uh, many others, uh, Universidad Nacional de Colombia is, is collaborating. And uh, from the private sector, we have companies from the construction, consulting, and even NGOs uh, in the city, uh, local, national, and international NGOs that are participating. As a result of this knowledge network, uh, we have already developed five intersectoral workshops uh, where we share experiences, uh, not only from Bogota, but also international experiences uh, related to implementing suits. Uh, as an example, uh, I will open my dashboard. Uh, 
Uh, this is a dashboard that was developed by some students uh, at the Universidad Nacional where in collaboration with all the network with, where we uh, present the location of the already constructed, the operating uh, suits in Bogota. So, so far we have 10, 12 typologies, but I will share later on that we have many, many hundreds others already in design and starting their implementation in the city. Um, it's important to mention that, uh, well, the base for this ne network to work is, is the regulations. So uh, for you, uh, might be very well known that globally, we have many regulations, many guidance, uh, and we'll, uh, for instance, the IPCC report where these uh, suits and even the nature-based solutions start becoming very, very important uh, uh, globally for not only managing the, the stormwater uh, in the cities, but also uh, many other issues. Um, for instance, uh, in this regulation locally, uh, we already have a design criteria. We have um, many um, instructions for, for any people, constructors, consulting, uh, that would like to implement suits in public areas uh, with typologies such as dry detention ponds, storage tanks, infiltration drains, tree pits, grass swells, permeable pavements, and bioreflect cells. So all this um, network is working uh, mostly in public areas. But right now uh, we are we started working on, on on private areas as well. So we may include later on, uh, uh, for instance, uh, green roofs, red barrels, and so on. So in the um, in the planning uh, of Bogota at 2022, 2035, uh, uh, we are now including every typology uh, to be connected either on the natural or the artificial drainage network of the city. Every pro infrastructure project at least must uh, include 10% of the total area in the project as a, 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 as a suit a typologies. And any of these typologies that uh, should be connected to the drainage, artificial drainage network must be uh, approved by the Bogota sewer company. So, um, we have a very elaborated scheme, and uh, I will not explain it in detail because of time restrictions. But uh, let's say that here I have all the components on this uh, network of imposing, uh, approving, and then finally implementing suits in public areas in Bogota. The, the main um, item that I would like to highlight here is that there are several uh, governmental institutions in Bogota that they participate in this process. So for instance, there is a consultant firm who is going to build a road in Bogota. So the Urban Development Institute uh, start checking all the process and they move all the documentation to the environmental agency in Bogota and the botanical garden that they will check every uh, paisajistic design and every permit, uh, forestal uh, a permit, and maybe some a river um, a inclusion that they may uh, consider. And then if the typology will release the stormwater into the artificial drainage network, then the, the sewer company Bogota will check and approve uh, all the hydraulics in, in the typology. So, around the one project, which is basically infrastructure roads, uh, all the institutions start working around and, and they have uh, a nice uh, diagram uh, to approve this implementation. This is important because um, it used to happen here that one infrastructure project uh, might not consider all the topics and, and, and uh, the institutions and finally, the projects, maybe they don't succeed um, on implementing these kind of structures. Now we have a, a example. So here you can see uh, infiltration trench, uh, trench uh, construction process 
uh, in Bogota, uh, in the middle of the road. Um, it, this is already finished, it's working, it is storage 450 uh, cubic meters. Um, we also have one of the first projects in Bogota, which is a tree, tree free uh, project uh, in the side curve of a street. They are interconnected and they store six uh, cubic meters uh, per rain event. Um, there are also, um, th these two are finished. They are operating. Now we are monitoring them. We are seeing what, what is going on with the maintenance and, and operation. But there are these examples. These are uh, a bio retention zones that you may see here in the top right a picture that it used to be only concrete and, and pavement. Now uh, we are seeing the bio retentions and, and all the benefits that we are looking at, uh, especially on amenity and all the hydrological benefits of these, these structures. Uh, further in, in planning, um, there is um, a big uh, highway that goes from south to north in, in the city. It will include around 140 structures uh, along the project. This will be the, the biggest uh, project of infrastructure in South America that will include suits. Uh, uh, it's in design uh, phase and we expect it to start uh, in, be implemented in less than a year. There is also a implementation and, and a design in this, in this moment about a 50 suit structures along the bus rapid tra trans transport system, which we call Transmillennium Bogota. And uh, basically we are uh, we're planning to implement three pits to manage the excess overall. So in conclusion, as of January of 2023, uh, we have already 266 structures uh, in design uh, already approved and 10 already uh, approved, implemented and in operation. Um, from, from these experiences, um, we have many challenges. The, the first one is the implementation of suits in private areas that we are working on. Uh, along that, uh, the, how to include the tributary incentives and how to uh, quantify the benefits uh, uh, of implementing these structures are the main uh, topics that we are looking at. Also, uh, we are taking a, a, a close attention to improving design and planning practices because the policy already have criteria, but uh, we have discovered that many typologies require some improving, especially on uh, auxiliary structures for uh, placing the sensors for uh, monitoring and also to improve the quality of the water, of the restored water. And finally, uh, one of the big challenges that we are facing now is um, how to follow up, how to establish man maintenance and, and monitoring uh, of these structures. So around that, um, uh, we here in Bogota, um, at the campus of Universidad Nacional of Colombia, that we are looking at the uh, picture in the right of the slide. It's like um, a small city within Bogota, we have our own uh, sewer network. We have our uh, own uh, mini small administration, everything. And we, uh, around that, we have developed uh, a sensor network to monitor precipitation and, and flow rates in the drainage network. So from there, we are working in three topics, uh, developing GIS tools to follow up and monitor the structures. Uh, right now, uh, I have several master's students that they are developing this type of uh, dashboards, as I showed you before, and some forms uh, developed by uh, products from the ESRI, the RGIS uh, uh, software, um, in order to go to the field and capture data and try to detect uh, when the maintenance uh, is required, especially preventive and corrective and also to do some monitoring and quantity and quality of the stormwater water that is coming into the structures. Also, uh, we are working on uh, the suits uh, modeling uh, for both planning and, and following up the structures. So right now we have models in, in the campus um, where we calibrate and validate for store events and further uh, we are trying to uh, simulate scenarios of implementing suits.
especially to try to identify the benefits of these the different, uh, different uh, typologies. As I mentioned, is one of the challenges of the network, and we are trying to, fa uh, to face that from the MOL inside. And finally, uh, the monitoring is a challenge. Uh, we are trying to develop low cost sensors with master uh, students here, comparing them with traditional multi parameter equipment and see well how these low cost sensors uh, perform. Are they reliable? Are they really um, trustworthy? And to do that, uh, we implemented a rain, a rain barrel that you may see here in the right of the slide in, within the campus that we are monitoring and we are um, in this moment uh, uh, assessing the, the development and, and um, all the performance of the sensors. So in conclusion, um, we have uh, go for a long way in Bogota, many years, many institutions, a lot of uh, nice people that they say, hey, we need to do something. Uh, they gather together and not only uh, governmental institutions, but also academic and private sector and uh, have composed this nice network. We are uh, successfully implementing suits. Right now, we are at the stage of uh, facing maintenance and, and monitoring of these structures. And at the end, uh, we would like to recommend uh, what, what is the next step of implementing suits in the city and to find out what is the relationship between these suits and the drainage system in Bogota, and also to strengthen the decision-making process all process of the suits implementations in the city. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't went over my time. Thank you so much, Mr. Mancipa. Um, as we will continue later with the questions, um, I would ask now uh, Dr. John O'Kelly to start with his presentation. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be talking about the benefits of sustainable urban drainage systems, and uh, this is uh, based on South Africa. I just want to mention uh, quickly here that uh, the management of stormwater in South Africa and generally in Africa is quite different from the global north, uh, that's in Europe, because there you have uh, combined sewer overflows. But here in South Africa and generally in Africa, we have separated systems where the stormwater does not really end up in the wastewater treatment plants. So it's a separated system, and the water is actually flushed directly into the receiving streams and flows directly into the ocean. So that's the context in terms of management of stormwater uh, in Africa. Uh, so uh, Cape Town recently published what they call the water strategy, our shared future. And with regard to stormwater management, uh, they have five commitments. But with regard to stormwater management, one that is more relevant is commitment number three where they have a vision of sufficient, reliable water supply from diverse sources, uh, uh, including stormwater as one of them. So that's one of the visions. But also commitment number five, where they have a vision of a water-sensitive city. And uh, what's relevant for stormwater management is the, uh, the optimal use of stormwater and urban waterways for purposes of flood control, aquifer recharge, and water reuse. So uh, the city of Cape Town has this vision of uh, using stormwater as part of the augmentation of the groundwater resources and reuse. So my, my presentation will be largely around that. How do they, how the cities see themselves augmenting water resources with stormwater? But prior to that, uh, a water strategy that was, what was published in uh, 2019, if, a few years ago, 2013 and 2014, colleagues at the University of Cape Town uh, came up with uh, what they call the, the, the guidelines, how do you manage sustainable urban drainage systems and water sensitive design. And so they produce guidelines on how to design, implement and maintain some of this uh, infrastructure with regard to sustainable urban drainage systems. And in fact, the water strategy now we incorporated some of the ideas from these documents. And also the design manual that have been published more recently are incorporating ideas uh, from these manuals on how to manage uh, stormwater using sustainable water drainage systems. But how does this approach work? How does this SADS approach work? It, it really envisions everyone taking part uh, in the management of stormwater, right from uh, the household level, where when it rains, uh, we expected to go rain 
water harvesting and whatever is not able, not able to collect the water harvesting can flow within the area closer to the household and can begin to infiltrate surfaces in those areas. And this item is called good housekeeping. And now the water that can't be managed at household level can drain uh, outside this, this, this area and then is managed in the local uh, or the neighborhood scale. And this is called source control. And in those locations, you have detention facilities and treatment. And in that area, also you're, you're, the endeavor there, or you're trying to hold water for as long as possible, wherever it falls. And of course, what cannot be managed at a neighborhood scale is then managed at a local scale. And that's really a suburb now. And what can be managed at the suburb is also managed downstream, close to the suburb which is called regional controls. But for all these steps, you can already see an attempt to create what they call a sponge city to infiltrate water into the ground because there's sufficient storage is there and that water can be extracted and reused. So SADS is very strongly linked to, to water harvesting. And I'm going to be showing a few photos of how this is implemented. And I just took a few photos from some of the households. As you can see in this photo, uh, the rainwater harvesting, water coming off the roof into the tank, but any overflows, the overflow, in fact, onto the areas around the building. Uh, so it's uh, there's an opportunity there for infiltration, but also the downpipes do not go straight into the stormwater network. It flows into the neighborhood of the building and uh, that promotes uh, managed aquifer recharge. And uh, also you can see here, and this is really all of, all of these photos are at a neighborhood scale. Instead of having this downpipe coming to the impervious areas, it's bent into the area that are pervious, and this would promote uh, infiltration in those areas as well. And this is another example of uh, uh, rainwater harvesting, but the downpipes or the overflow does not go to the pervious areas. It goes to the, uh, it doesn't go to the pervious areas. It goes to the pervious areas, and this will then promote uh, infiltration of the spaces. Uh, so, in the neighborhood scale, uh, what really happens is we're doing away with curb lines, and if there's any water in the roads, we we'll drain directly in these uh, filter strips or swells, and this definitely promotes uh, augmentation of the resources of the city. As you can see here, all the curb lines are gone, and the water drains directly off the roads into spaces like this, keeps them greener, but also infiltrates and recharges the groundwater systems. And for some people who are still wanting their curb lines, what you do, you dent them, and when you dent them, this water then spills over from the road into the spaces. And you can put a, a four bay, and this will hold and will try to improve the water quality of space. And as you can see, also in this circle here, so these circles are also dented. And this water, instead of bringing this water to irrigate the spaces, uh, you can, uh, so water can actually do that. First of all, keeping the areas green, but also augmenting the ground spaces. So the overall vision of how this will work is that within the city itself, at the household, suburb level, local level, there's infiltration uh, of water from those areas. And also, there are also pipe leaks as well. There was a point uh, to the groundwater resources, but also there's a vision of using wastewater and stormwater as well uh, in terms of the, the, the regional uh, detention facilities. They will all be contributing to the groundwater resources and then this definitely be pumped out eventually and reused. So I'll be speaking to two case studies. The first one is Atlantis. It's a small town within the city of Cape Town. It's about 50 kilometers from the CBD. And it's, it's almost isolated uh, up there, uh, but then they wanted to provide, so it's isolated from the existing water circulation system for the city. So they wanted to provide for it uh, in terms of water, how much, where we get its water uh, to sustain it. Then I also speak to the Cape Flats Aquifer, and this area is the low lying area of the city. And this also shows you the location of, of Cape Town, really at the tip, at the very bottom of, of the continent of Africa. So yeah, I'll just speak to these two. To, as an example, as exemplars of where SADS and Storm has been done well. Uh, sir, excuse me, I have a problem. Could you get closer to your microphone? I have a problem hearing you. Thank you very much. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, it's better now. If you get closer to the microphone, thank you. Uh, okay. I'll do that. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just start, start from here, probably. Just to say that I'm going to give two examples. Uh, 
the first one is using an, an urban area, a small town that is, uh, is part of the city of Cape Town, but it's about 50 kilometers from the CBD and it's isolated from the water reticulation system of the city. And the city tried to provide a separate water, water, water supply system for it. And the, the, the selected SADs or augmentation of groundwater resources using storm water uh, for this specific urban area. Then I also speak to the low lying areas of Cape Town, which is called the Cape Flats. And these areas are, uh, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for, for augmentation of groundwater resources in those spaces because they are nicely flat, they are sandy, so the properties of an aquifer are all there. So I'll speak to Atlantis first, uh, the small town uh, uh, within the city of Cape Town. And the way this one works is uh, you have the stormwater network draining into recharge basins uh, downstream of the town. Uh, and then you have abstraction wells just below uh, the recharge basins. As you can see on this top right corner, it shows the location of the city, the draining towards the recharge basins downstream of the, of the town, and then the abstraction wells also downstream of the recharge basins. And the way it works, they are combining stormwater and the domestic wastewater. And the domestic wastewater first goes through the maturation ponds, and these are eventually combined in reed beds, and before they are then recharged in recharge basins, and this they provide an additional benefit of groundwater treatment. And then this water is abstracted using a production wells, and then it's treated, a fully treated, and then returned into the small town as a water supply. Now, this system does not include industrial waste because we don't trust industrial waste, but it includes domestic wastewater uh, sources. Now, I'll talk to the Cape Flats Aquifer. Uh, the city of Cape Town has various high areas surrounding it, but has uh, uh, about 600 square kilometer area that's generally flat and sandy and has a good aquifer. And SADS is actually being implemented largely in those low lying areas. And the way it works is because there's an aquifer there that has water, but the water is not so much. So when you begin to pump, uh, the water table drops quite quickly because it's a very sandy aquifer. It's an unconfined sandy aquifer. And the plan there is uh, they're beginning to augment uh, those locations using stormwater and eventually also wastewater, uh, essentially to bump up the water table and to make the system, the whole system uh, uh, sustainable. So monitoring is very, very critical in those spaces because you don't want to bump it too much and cause flooding. So monitoring helps in terms of uh, managing the levels or, or understanding the evolution of the water table. And as you can see, some of the boreholes that have been uh, drilled here are high yielding boreholes, but they need to be sustainably uh, maintained using sands. Now, we recently got a grant uh, to begin piloting some of these ideas of SADs on our campus. And we're, and we're basically looking at various sources of water, but mainly storm water. Whenever it would previously would come to campus, uh, to rain on campus, the water just flows directly through the stormwater network into down uh, receiving streams. But what we're trying to do now is to identify where can we begin to use some of this storm water. How can we transition to sites even on a campus? And we're looking at various uses, including uh, garden irrigation, toilet flushing, and other non potable water uses, but also how do we store this water on campus? That's what uh, we're trying to identify those locations. Now, the goal for this project is to minimize the amount of water that, that actually comes onto campus uh, through municipal water supplies, but also minimize how much water is leaving campus uh, through stormwater drains. And we we'll begin to see benefits of actually stormwater harvesting on campus because we have sufficient, much more sufficient water to do irrigation. And those areas that are irrigated much more often, we begin to see that they're much cooler. And in fact, about five to 10 degrees difference in, on our campus only for the, the difference between the, the regular irrigated spaces and those that are built up and are heating up quite quickly. So we begin to see the benefit of urban cooling even with stormwater harvesting spaces. So in terms of the benefits that were identified, so SADS leads to stormwater harvesting and which will determine to be viable volumetrically and economically. But the problem is when you use it only for non-portable water uses, you need relatively large amounts of storages, which are not always readily available in an urban area. So besides water supply, we see that groundwater storages provide additional benefits 
as in the, the, the aquifer provides additional treatment, water quality improvement, but diuretic collection we noted that provides, uh, it gives and makes it makes the system even more costly because of the additional uh, uh, costs of managing a diuretic collection system. Then finally, uh, we would you know, realize that summer harvesting uh, in high pollution areas, there's a problem of perception. People do not readily accept this type of water if the area is highly polluted. So it uh, requires a lot of catchment management to be able to be acceptable. But also our climate models that we are using uh, to, to predict a future stormwater availability shows that there will be significant reduction in rainfall and then also stormwater. But overall, uh, ground storage seems to be the most suitable option. And this is what the city was also going for. And that's what we shall be going for because it provides storages, but also provide improved water quality. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, John Akiri. Um, you already, you, you were perfectly in time. <laughs> um, next one will be Stefan Bandermann. I, um, could you share your screen? Okay. I, um, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> I work in a um, engineering office and uh, our company deals with um, projects I'd like to present you. It's a stormwater management of a building complex on the border with Berlin. And um, <clears throat> this is uh, more a detailed uh, view uh, how we deal with different measures we have already heard in the other presentations. And um, I Certainly, when we talk about this SATs, we already heard about the sustainable urban drainage measurements. Uh, they have to be designed, and it depends on different climatic conditions, how they look like. And, and when we talk about um, conditions in Berlin, uh, where this project is located, uh, you see here, this is um, where we are. Um, I show you that this is at the border of Northeast Berlin. And it's, uh, although it's uh, close to the border of Brandenburg, um, highly uh, dense urban area. And um, this is an already existing shopping mall uh, where many cars go along the street and um, go shopping in this mall and there is parking area. And here adjacent the Berlin, area with um, yeah many people living here so uh, what to do um, the idea of the investor to have um, more room for living is not to go on the agriculture field or in the forest but to use the already parking area and um, okay i have to talk about the climate first um, yeah what's the weather in in, in uh, berlin and the climate conditions we used to be have a, a humid climate. Uh, normally, we have more rain than evaporation. Um, we used to have also normal seasons with freezing in winter time and up to a 20 degree in summertime. So uh, it used to be a humid climate, but uh, the development is that we have longer and hotter summer, shorter and milder winter. So we have a shortage of water in summer we uh, um, experience also heat stress, which is very unusual for Germany. And um, so um, we have also to adapt our stormwater management. In general, we deal uh, with around 570 may, uh, millimeter rain per year and, and 650 millimeter of evaporation, uh, which mainly takes uh, place in, in uh, spring and in summer. So the shopping mall, as you can see here, is this area and this parking lot. And this new building complex is planned on top of this parking area. And this car park remains. So the building complex is just set up on this area. And after the building complex is set up, still the cars can park underneath this building complex. So there is multifunction uh, for many people, for people who go shopping, but also therefore living 
And um, as you see here in this first draft of the architect, uh, we see how this building complex looks like. This is about 500 meter along the main street. And there are different blocks which are next to each other. We have a living and, and we have um, also doctors and kindergartens and, and all kinds of, of use. And um, on top of this uh, parking area, we have a roof, um, which is an intensive green roof and people can meet each other here on these blocks. And there's also a protect protection of noise so um, and that will give quite a, a um, big um, a scene here so how to deal with the storm water which now um, has to be taken into account and um, the general conditions are that no discharge from the water from the storm water into the adjacent storm water system of berlin is allowed so <clears throat> The stormwater event of a 100 annuality has to be managed completely on the property. So natural balance is a goal of stormwater management planning. So what options do we have? We have to deal with evapotranspiration, the storage of stormwater, irrigation, and finally infiltration. <clears throat> What we want to do is the application of uh, sponge city principles, and that uh, different measures of SARTs we implement on this uh, building complex. And especially we deal here with evaporation, purification, storage, irrigation, throttle discharge, and infiltration. And how we do this, I will show you. Uh, we have the, in, um, the, the principle of a cascade. We will uh, start with a top roof where the water is um, um, yeah, purified and, and stored and on the top level. We then have <clears throat> water also going down um, on the second floor where we have the parking lot with an intensive green roof. From there, this water will also be stored and used for the facade greening. And finally, the water which is not evaporating or used for irrigation will finally flow to the swales where it should infiltrate. So that is the general principle what we want to apply here. What we start is we want on top of the buildings um, combine the extensive green roof with solar panels, <clears throat> um, as you see here are some examples, how it looked like and um, how is it made of. We have a six centimeter vegetation layer, a three centimeter of retention layer, and um, what the water which is not uh, evaporating has a runoff of 10 liter per second hectare into the intensive green roof, which is then following. So as you see here, this is a principle of the green roof combined with a solar panel. And we have quite good experience that it works well together. So secondly, we have a green roof with an intensive green roof um, where we also have um, more vegetation like small trees, 50 centimeters of a vegetation layer and uh, a, a more storage uh, for retention. It's combined with capillary rise for the vegetation which is set up on this parking area. And the, we um, reduce the runoff to two liter per second and hectare into the facade greening, uh, which is here to um, hide the parking area and yeah, to look nicer for the uh, complete block because that's a 500 meter uh, um, block which has to be um, uh, built. Yeah, and what is not evaporating or used for irrigation finally will overflow in swales. This one I show. But an option is that we like to may um, have a steering of the retention layer so that we can, uh, um, yes, uh, finally um, try to optimize the irrigation of the green roof and also of the facade green. 
So the facade greening, as you can see here for parking areas, um, um, should help to improve um, evaporation. It helps to reduce heat stress along these long uh, buildings of concrete. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, it should Im improve the view of the city in general. So there are different methods how to implement the facade greening. And this is a quite, at least in Germany, uh, uh, quite new development and not easy also to calculate uh, how much water will be needed, how much is evaporating. So this is a field of um, research um, to, and, and um, yeah, it's a very interesting projects anyway. So what do we have between those blocks? There are sidewalks uh, uh, where people can stay and, and relax. And um, there are dotted um, trees in between. And um, yeah, we have the option to collect the water as seen in this depicted here in this picture. Um, we will collect the water from streets or at least here from this um, sealed area and um, the water flows into peat, uh, tree pits. We have seen this in Bogota. That was very interesting that you also deal with those measurements. And um, there is the option to purify by the soil, to store it underneath. And when there is too much water in this tree pit, it has the option also to um, infiltrate into the adjacent soil, as well as uh, is planned to have capillary rise also here from the bottom to the soil that the roots of the tree uh, can take part of this water. <clears throat> as well here, we have also an overflow to the adjacent swales where, where the water finally will infiltrate. Here are some uh, examples. We have built such a tree pit uh, of the in, uh, International Gardening uh, Exhibition in Berlin in 2017, and there are uh, other examples, as you see here, of tree pits also here in Portland, USA, for example, some pictures or also here in Australia already existing. <clears throat> yeah, so this is the final one, the infiltration into the swales. They are already existing, but they will be rebuilt and should finally look um, nicer and, and greener. Um, but they have to rebuild because the, the capacity of the existing swales uh, are not good enough to, um, uh, yes, to, to, to hold the complete water. And um, yeah, you see here um, the details of the measure. So it's from the extensive green roof, finally flowing into the intensive green roof. Uh, <clears throat> then it's uh, used for a f uh, irrigation for the facade greening as well, with an overflow to the swale as well as the, the tree pit. So the swales are connected to each other that uh, maximum infiltration can take place. But uh, these are the measurements. How do we prove that it all works? We use it with the software. It's a runoff model um, by our company, the Storm model. Um, so storm, um, it's calculating with design storms. Uh, yes, for different durations, like five year return periods or 50 or 100. Um, we use long-term simulation when um, those data is available we can prove the quality and um, see how the treatment of the swales or the green roofs are to improve quality of the stormwater. And finally, we can also calculate the water balance. So <clears throat> we use this with rain data to, um, um, yes, a rain station, which is not far away from this area. And uh, this long-term simulation gives us finally results uh, how many overflows we can expect. So for example, in this case, we calculated that two, um, yes, there takes um, an overflow um, every 2.5 years. And so in this case, the five year annuality is not reached and the model has to be improved and the storage maybe uh, needs to be increased. Yeah, what else can we do with this model? Oops, I'm sorry, this is too, too fast, sorry. 
Sometimes it reacts slowly. Uh, now, okay. Now we see uh, we can calculate the water balance of the different sacks. For example, what's the water balance of an uh, intensive green roof or an extensive green roof? For example, we have here high evaporation uh, uh, and a little bit of runoff. For an extensive, gr extensive green roof, we have less evaporation and more runoff, but still a lot of evapotranspiration. And for permeable um, areas, uh, there's also infiltration. And, and with all these combination of uh, the water balance, we can figure out which will come close to the natural water balance. So, the treatment of the stormwater is also calculated um, depending, for example, of the thickness of the vegetation layer uh, or the uh, um, distance to the groundwater from the uh, swales. And uh, these um, treatments have also um, yeah, to be proved and given to the uh, water authorities um, that um, the water quality is um, uh, good enough to, to infiltrate this from these um, blocks, we don't have really have heavy load on this uh, building complex because we have no parking areas or streets we deal with. So we are quite confident that we have a good quality in this complex. Okay, that was an example. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for, the, for your presentation, Stefan. Um, now I will hand over to Elodie Bruno. So we had a great presentation, uh, different situation, different orientations, pretty. First, I want to thank each uh, participant and the four students, Leo, five, sorry, five students, Leo, Etienne, Luis and Miguel, the edge to training in master, and they work together and they think on how we can better integrate uh, rainwater, uh, uh, urban rainwater management at the various scales with very uh, different uh, complementary uh, skills and competence. In uh, with uh, there, there is an engineer, a geographer, geographer, a microbiologist, an ecologist. So it's most interesting to have them work together and to see them uh, organize this meeting with your three speakers. I don't know if uh, the students wish to handle the Q&A session for the presentations. Yeah, we're supposed to for each speaker. Well, each, uh, but you know, you can uh, you can ask questions by raising your hand. You know, with the yellow hand, or orally, otherwise. Uh, we do have already a couple of written questions and we can ask the, the written questions so so i'm supposed to do a summary so i don't have any uh material for presentation well simply for maybe you could think about uh ponder a specific question i think it's interesting to look at the three context with the for example, uh, in Bogota, the main problem is the floods. John, I think the problem is a water resource, you know, uh, and Stefan, we're more dealing with a urban development project, which is very common to what we see in Europe and in France. But of course, we, we want to uh, restore life in the city and guarantee and guarantee the runoff water quality that can be recycled and reused in water. So three integrated visions of the challenges and the solutions for rainwater management. I think in Bogota, what's quite remarkable is the integrated vision of the number of players, the mobilization of all the players, you know, the, the in the territory, the state, scientists, academics, and the awareness raising done around that. John, it's a completely integrated vision of water management in the territory, including the re recovery of a treated wastewater to refill, the recharge the resorts, very local at the scale of a building, but also at the scale of the uh, groundwater table, the aquifer, which is the resource for the territory at the city, and which is recharged as much as possible with your systems, and then 
the integrated aspect of the of the operation next to this urban planning uh, project near Berlin. Well, the 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 combination at the building, at the, well, the combination of several solutions that uh, add to one another, the, including between the private sector and the public sector, because clearly there is the building and there are also roads and uh, development projects. And also this co combination, current combination, and this, um, the need to, to link up vegetal, rain management, uh, sun power, and clearly there is a synergy between the sun power, vegetalization of roofs, irrigation of uh, vegetal walls, and clearly there is a whole synergy at the scale of the project, which is quite fascinating. Maybe let me shed a light on the, the experience in Lyon, and we'll take the questions at the end, okay. I run an association called the Grey, which is the research animation center on water. We were created almost 40 years ago to link up all the uh, stakeholders in between uh, urban planners and managers of water to go a better, to have a more sustainable measure of water in urban area. And uh, we went for looking for all solutions of rain water or stem water at the source. And if I could establish, uh, do a metaphor, you know, it was a rather, you know, uh, we had difficulty rowing the boat, if I can say so, you know, we can see in France, in Europe, at the world level, those solutions are not clearly have been identified as being the uh, solution to be deployed, not as an alternative, but as main uh, solutions. And we see now several uh, uh, regulatory frameworks, uh, instruments for incentives, such and therefore solutions and projects are being implemented. At, in France, I would refer refer to the uh, European uh, Water Framework Directive, which has in, which you know which uh, which insists on the reduction of uh, urban discharge of rainwater. Uh, you know, rainwater, because, you know, we have to manage at the source. And more recently, a uh, program for water agencies and a national plan at the level of the ministry, which are strongly and uh, strong incentives for the management of rainwater at the source and, of course, infiltration. Often the question is, how do we launch the change, initiate the change, we feel that everybody has a clear vision of what needs to be done. When you talk about the main principle, be with the local elected uh, officials or engineers, technicians, they all have a shared vision of proper management of rainwater at the source. The problem is in the practical implementation, because then you've got to change habits, methods, sizing, design, and then also we uh, we are dealing with sometimes the contradictory requirements, you know, the public space requirements, sun power, vegetalization. Uh, so vision is shared, but the problem is to deploy the solutions. And we can see as well that uh, hindrings are not technical. Actually, the obstacles are more, not technical, but more associated with the understanding, awareness raising, change of practice, and uh, we need to develop different solutions to go into that direction. So this is our motivation in the Grey, and we've done a lot of things to go into this uh, uh, direction. We have research program with characterization you know, efficacy of uh, more, uh, our system. We have technical groups. We work with developers, urban planners, ecology specialists to support the territories in their change. And in terms of a dissemination of knowledge, we have several observatories which make it possible to see what is done in the region. We organize national, regional, international meetings. I'll mention Novatech later on. And of course, we're trying to deploy all and implement all these elements. I was asked to focus on the Lyon Metropole. Well, well, we started this. Uh, uh, we started this about forty years ago, after uh, with the Grey. Uh, recently, things have been uh, getting more, gaining momentum with this new strategy of a permeable city. The Metropole of Lyon wants to remove impervious, impervious surfaces, several hectares of areas, 
and and we want to uh, foster infiltration in public and private space and this is uh, uh, we have to change the culture within the water management service in the road systems or the private developers and the metropole of Lyon is now uh, using human resources to support the change and that we would have systematic uh, the connection between uh, water filtration and uh, and um, filtration of rainwater uh, as a support to solution so this is what i want to say and finally when it comes to uh oh, you know at the in Lyon, at the national or regional territory often we've initiated the, the system with the problem of floods of course floods those were the first motivation to develop our our solutions you know at the source rapidly came the problem of pollution because of the urban affluence during rainfalls at the outlet of uh, often um, co uh, combined uh, sewer systems. So, and we had untreated uh, rainwater or, or urban runoffs and climate evolution means that the pressure on the resource and the utilization of rainwater as, a, as an alternative resource. Well, I would want to say, you know, is quite brutal now and um and this is a major change of practice you know to be done at the uh in the national territory that's it this is what i want to share with you merci beaucoup uh, elodie uh, maintenant du coup on peut passer aux questions i was wondering if the policies and regulations that have been implemented in bogota have been effective at changing the rainwater management paradigm, not only in Bogota or in Colombia, but also in Latin America? Uh, well, um, I would say yes. Um, South America is, in, is, in, is starting to implement uh, suits and nature-based solutions. Uh, we, we recently participated in a, in a seminar uh, with a private sector, public sector and academic in Bolivia, who's also implementing a lot of suits, Peru. Um, Brazil has been leading also the topic here for many years, even I think before that Colombia. Um, I think the governments are aware that uh, we need to do something with the storm water. Uh, we are also facing not only excess of storm water, but also deficit of storm water um, in urban areas, and that that this situation has imposed some challenges. However, um, I think and that's a personal opinion that the the culture it's very difficult to change uh, because our countries uh, they have. Uh, some uh, very um, um, old customs and old views of how we need to deal with the storm water. Um, I think we copy it basically the same uh, American or American uh, scheme where first we wanted to take all the storm water and push it out from the cities. That's why we still have some combined sewers, uh, also like in Africa. Uh, um, that has been changing. Now we have separate systems. However, um, now we are dealing with uh, impermeabilization, at a high speed in the cities. Everyone wants to take out all the vegetation and pervy surfaces. Uh, now we are trying to going back again <laughs> to that point. But it's, it's difficult and uh, it's a long process, especially um, we need to educate the people. And that's a critical part. Um, I don't think anyone in, in South America is it's, uh, implementing some uh, effective strat strategies around that, but uh, we needed to face the problem. And, and I think we started implementing the, the solutions and dealing with all the issues uh, along the way. I have a question to Nestor. Uh, it has to do with regulations or directives uh, which exist in Colombia. Do they impact the private sector? And uh, and how do they ex kind of govern the private sector? 
No, the actual policies and regulations are only for uh, public areas. So basically public institutions are the ones uh, leading the, the, the process. However, um, there is a, a, a very high interest, uh, especially in the construction sector, on start implementing these uh, structures for reducing and, and using the stone water into the, the buildings. And uh, there is a regulation process led by the Environmental uh, Protection Institution here in Bogota to try to regulate first uh, how to uh, use the stone water, how much can we uh, convey use, uh, what, the quality, what the water quality of this stone water should we have. We have, we have no regulation for that in Colombia as well. And, and then uh, the impact of uh, using this stone water on, on reducing the consume of water from the from the water utility because uh, basically Bogota uses for everything uh, potable water drinking water and uh, now we start uh, realizing that uh, any change on, on reducing this uh, consume uh, will impact the water utility and, and many other processes and also for industrial purposes the, we have detected some industries that they, they start using the stone water but uh, there is no regulation so far. So I, I guess we are at the middle stage there. now in the private areas, but mostly residential. And then I guess we'll move on into industrial and commercial. Uh, très bien, merci beaucoup. Elodie, je te, je te laisse la parole. I'll come back to the points developed by Nestor. In fact, if you ask a person, okay, you, you develop solutions at the source, you know, based on nature, send it your best solution. Each time the answer is to say, yes, but you know, we are slow. Yeah, but it doesn't move much. We, we're lagging behind. But in fact, everywhere in the world, change is difficult. Everywhere, in the, you know, all the, all the habits, all reflex as engineers, and all over the world, we have a feeling that we're moving slowly. But we do make a headway anyway. And I think what's done in Colombia, for example, is a remark. Uh, I have a feeling that I was very close to the spirit of uh, movement as we have in France or in Europe. That was my first comment. My second comment has to do with regulation. I did see in the organi organigram presented by Nestor, there was the instruction about the building permits in France, simply to give you in France, we, we we, uh, we know how to apply rules to the private sector, but we don't know how to apply that to uh, collectivities or, you know, the collectivities or public authorities know what, uh, you know, the rainfalls are and they're players of the, the de-impermeabilization, you know, the, but uh, they are usually applied to private sector, you know, for example, they cannot collect, connect to the sanitation system, they must store in their plot of land or, you know, and they have, they have a, they have influence with limited flow rate, but we we kind of uh, we sort of stepping back. We say, okay, it's fine to impose this to the private uh, sector, but maybe we should do it also in the public sector, you know, to manage the infiltration and the runoffs. Uh, the store. Now, my question as to the building permits. I mean, is there an aspect the story in this about the building permits? Is there something about that? Yes, I guess that's the the challenge. <laughs> We have uh, different uh, permit uh, buildings. Um, we have like two categories, uh, one that is like low cost, uh, middle and high cost. And um, there are some requirements uh, that financially and economically uh, usually doesn't uh, allow to, to implement the suits. So I actually have a master's student right now who's, who's trying to analyze how to uh, balance financially these kind of uh, projects. So they, they uh, achieve all the technical requirements for the uh, building permit, but also we can include a few suits uh, and then maybe reuse the water uh, without increasing or going out of the, um, the, con the financial side. I guess that's the main challenge. Um, but then um, the building permit is not uh, provided um, for any of the institutions that right now uh, are working on the network. It's it's like a 
private area, private group of people. Uh, architects and engineers, and they are not a governmental entity. So that's another issue. So far, we have been able, like, uh, on governmental institutions to, to work together. But now we're trying to get into these uh, associations uh, to work with us because that's a, a big challenge. I, I've seen that in uh, other countries, uh, the building permit is, is provided by an, a governmental entity. So it kind of uh, solves that issue, but for us, it's a big issue. I don't know if I uh, answered your questions. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Um, Thank you. Laurence Gira has a question. Back to the infiltration issues. What are the solutions used for uh, uh, urban uh, floors which are clay or, you know, like or, uh, or when there are caves or gro grottoes or basements? How do you deal with that? Well, there are uh, specific uh, instructions for clays, but for cars, for example, if we're in zones which could be charged or calcareous ground, we won't do infi massive infiltration or deep infiltration. What's important, regardless of the soil, is to think about what can be done, regardless of the underground, you know, the what can you do in the first uh, layers of the ground? Terrains usually were natural terrains. And we often we ask ourselves questions, whereas if we just comply with the capability of storage of uh, or evapotranspiration or even infusion of natural grounds, uh, soils, uh, it's, you know, don't go for additional constraints uh, when you got clay or, or you know, cork stick or, or you know, or with uh, uh, voids or cave. Uh, there is a guide. I'll, I'll try to give you the link before the end of the meeting. Nestor, did you have to deal with this problem of karstic or clay uh, per, per, uh, impervious soils? Uh, uh, we have mostly clays, actually. And, uh, and that's why uh, if we take a detailed look at the, at the regulation, most of our topologies, the, they don't rely on infiltration, actually. We mostly look at the detention and uh, improving evaporation as well. One question for uh, for Berlin. Um, I was wondering if you considered climate change in the design of green infrastructure. Did you look at you know how uh, design rainfall or temperature could evolve in the future, and therefore, um, how could that impact the performance of your structure in the future? Yes, that's a very good question. And. Um, Ooh, yeah, it, it is not, not easy to consider it. it, it it's depending a little bit or on, on uh, the local authorities, how they deal with it. Some uh, just uh, put a factor on it and they say you have to design uh, SATs or other stormwater management measures uh, with plus 20 percent, something like that. And um, in, in some areas, uh, we don't consider it at all. Uh, we certainly have climate data from the past so that we can quite good um, design them just as you said totally correctly that uh, we don't know exactly how the the development will go and and what we will expect so um, yes there there are certain in, in engineering is always that you um, work with security factors and we definitely will do so to make sure uh, we have no surprises uh, uh, after we build all these measurements. But uh, that is an, a not answered question, I think, uh, for, for all engineers. What I would like to support is that, in general, also the engineers and also authorities, um, uh, they, they learned uh, not to trust nature. To, to put all in technical devices. And this has to be changed and it takes a generation that you take nature into account. That was, uh, was also said uh, by, by Ms. Gray already. And um, that uh, feeling I, I have very often, if, if you talk about infiltration, like 3.5 millimeter per hour. So uh, almost all engineers tell you that this is not infiltration. 
triple double that these soils are not usable for stormwater management. But that is uh, not our experience. So you just need the storage and a little bit longer time to store the water and it will finally infiltrate. I mean, uh, uh, a soil which can infiltrate three millimeters per hour can infiltrate 60,000 millimeter per year. So um, it's it's uh, another matter of how to, to deal with it. We all deal with security factors to make sure nothing happens, but we never take the water balance into account. And this is, as we have all over the world, it, I think it doesn't matter if it's Bogota or it's South Africa or Germany, uh, we, we need other regulations and to consider uh, other parameters to, to set up our cities. Uh, Leo, peut-être tu as une question? Yes, I have a question for, because we were talking about infiltration, um, I have a question for the case of Cape Town. You were talking about um, the fact that you do not consider industrial effluents until now um, for the infiltration. And I was just wondering also regarding climate change and water scarcity. Um, do you think there will be, like on the one hand, which, what are these industrial effluents? And do you think uh, this paradig paradigm will change maybe someday? Um, or are you already considering it in, in some um, early planning stages? Okay, so the, the issue of, uh, of wastewater, uh, the, the, the wastewater treatment plants in Cape Town manage uh, 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 domestic wastewater. Uh, industrial wastewater is largely managed by the industries themselves because the capacity of wastewater treatment plants is not set up uh, for industrial uh, wastewater. So that's why, uh, and also the, the the contaminants are not uh, within the wastewater treatment uh, wastewater processes are not well known. Whereas we have a lot of experience in terms of treatment of biological uh, contaminants within the domestic. So that's why. So the I think it's around really experience because industries keep introducing many other things within the uh, within their processes. Which, uh, which which is not able to cope with in terms of treatment. Uh, we also understand that uh, even domestic, they could be uh, pharmaceuticals and all those sorts of things. But uh, in terms of the level, that's, that's why we 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 we, we mix the storm water uh, to 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 reduce the concentration. So I think it's really around experience of treatment of domestic. That's why we trust it much more rather than the industrial, which is always evolving and we can't cope in terms of treatment. Uh, that, that's, that's the one thing you've mentioned about why we don't use industrial. Uh, in terms of climate change, yes, we, we model that as well. And we see in some parts, uh, yeah, in, 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 for Cape Town at least, uh, South Africa generally, uh, the future, uh, Rainfall uh, MAP, the mean annual precipitations will definitely drop. Uh, and uh, so, if you talk about uh, stormwater harvesting in terms of volumes, we see that uh, reducing. But interestingly, intensities in, in some in some of some of those uh, rainfall will increase. So it's it's, a, it's it's quite interesting to see that there will be flooding, but it's because of the increase in intensities. But the volumes themselves of rainfall will drop. So that will definitely impact uh, our resources that we're looking at. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that's how we have to work with that. Uh, but also SADS, whatever rainfall you get, if you can augment your volunteer resources, uh, that, that will definitely build resilience within the water supply system. Uh, so why we actually augmenting is South Africa generally will rely, currently will rely largely on surface water systems. But with climate change predicting increase in temperature and increase in evaporation because of the increase in temperature, uh, our best uh, bet would be to have groundwater resources that are, uh, that are less impacted by increase in temperature. So SADS will definitely find a bigger role even with climate change because if you're augmenting uh, groundwater resources, you're hiding it away from climate change impacts of increase in temperature. Uh, but also providing a diverse resource uh, and building resilience within the city uh, with a diverse resource. Okay, thank you. 
And sorry, can I ask a little second question? Like, are the industries do they also rely on the same aquifers when on, um, yes for their water sources, or do they have other water sources? So at the moment, uh, the entire Cape Town relies on surface water uh, sources. Uh, but uh, so the groundwater aspect is great to build resilience within the water supply system. But at the moment, about 70% of the water is coming from surface and also industry because they're big users, they, they definitely relying largely on, on, uh, on, uh, on surface water sources. But uh, there's a move now to move. Uh, but the, problem, the thing is, uh, uh, groundwater is there, but uh, the, the problem was how do you manage it sustainably? Because we're talking about unconfined aquifers that you can actually quite quickly drain uh, using pumping. So with, with the promotion of augmentation, then you can sustainably manage these sources. So even industry, when this when the system develops eventually, yes, they will be encouraged also to move towards the groundwater, uh, but not, not yet. Right now, Merci beaucoup. Justement, en parlant Thank you des... very much. Uh, talking about the surface water uh, waters and the quality of surface waters, do you have um, at Cape Town issues related to flooding, flood events, uh, related to extreme uh, storm events? And how do you manage uh, the draining the drainage system? Is it a primary system or combined system in Cape Town, what do you have as a system? Okay, so in terms of surface water, uh, contamination of surface water, uh, this, all our dams are far away from the urban areas. Uh, uh, there the, uh, the are areas that are mountainous, close to uh, Cape Town, and so the dams, are, the catchments are quite protected. So in, in fact, the quality of the you know, surface water is, is quite good. Uh, and even the treatment process is, is quite limited because the catchments are very well protected. So that's not a problem at all. Uh, the, the only worry now is climate change that will deplete the, the, the sources in terms of reduction of rainfall, but also increased temperature that will increase the, the evaporation because of the increased temperature. That's the one. Uh, management of stormwater in Cape Town is separated systems. It's not combined sewer overflows. It's separated systems. Uh, but now, uh, now now it actually makes sense to combine because now we want to use those two for augmentation. But because the quality is different, maybe it's even better to keep them separate and then first of all take the wastewater treatment wastewater to the wastewater treatment plant and through maturation ponds before you can then recharge them in the aquifer. Whereas the stormwater is relatively clean, so that will have a different route, doesn't have to go through the wastewater treatment plant. Also, just to remind you that uh, there, there's uh, a lot of pressure on the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, they are, uh, they, there's pressure already from the, the inflows uh, from, the, from, the, from the domestic. So they, in, in adding another one, uh, adding, so they, they need to be, the capacity needs to be improved anyway. But at the moment, it's, it's just enough to manage domestic. So we cannot yet combine uh, uh, Stormwater and wastewater to the wastewater treatment plant. So it is separate, but also it is, it is managed that way because the intensities are quite high. And so you will need very big pipes if you're to for, for just the, for the wastewater. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're not be able to handle the flows uh, from the stormwater. Yeah. Now there was a hand there. Et John, sauf erreur de ma part, vous utilisiez les eaux. So usées. you use the domestic wastewater treated wastewater to uh, 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 reload the aquifer and you treat separately the industrial waters, correct? So the industrial water has a, we, a different process. Uh, so that one is largely ma managed by the industries themselves. So it's separate as well. Yeah, the, the industry wastewater does not end up at the wastewater treatment plant for the city, because that's only designed for domestic. Maybe to make a parallel with the French context, there are a lot of uh, people in France use groundwater 
as drinking water resource is with an advantage as far as quality is concerned because uh, underground water are of a better quality than the surface waters. And today, in the management of rainwaters or stormwater, when we uh, want to uh, uh, recharge the uh, underground reserves, we have to have centralized uh, a centralized system um, because uh, because of the recharge. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, you have the source uh, evapotranspiration, but the more we are at the source, the least we recharge the underground water uh, reserve. So we want to deploy solutions at the source, but if project to recharge uh, the underground reserves, uh, it would be in our interest to have semi-centralized systems with infrastructure basins that have the capacity to recharge the underground reserves. So there's a new dilemma between management at the source or uh, semi-centralized management with the uh, when it comes to recharge the underground reserves. Uh, très bien, merci beaucoup, uh, Elodie. Je, Thank you a... very much, Elodie. Was Laurent Gérard who wanted to ask a question? I think Laurent Gérard. Laurence, I'm sorry, Laurence. Thank you. So my question would be for Elodie. At the level of Lyon, I heard about the previousness of the project or previousness project. I wonder if it was uh, just an example on what was done in the public areas or public spaces, which was meant to generate actions at the private level. If there are tools, things we can leverage on to um, encourage change of practices, eventually major operations. Well, this question, I don't remember if the uh, adoption objectives are on private or public areas. The idea is to encourage uh, private uh, neighbors to make these savings. So, uh, we can't connect the rainwater uh, rainwaters on the uh, 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 drainage system. I'm sorry, she has no microphone. Oop. There you go. I, I'm sorry, the microphone wasn't working. So, have to uh, deconnecting, infiltration, and visualization. The uh, uh, Lyon urban area uh, developed uh, the hydro umbrella uh, program so uh, that we make available simulation tools to help size and design. Uh, uh, drainage systems, rainwater drainage system at the level of what? So, uh, thanks, thanks, I'm very good, but it's existing for a while, it's not necessarily uh, on that, the, um, uh, the urban area is um, basing its, uh, its programs. But I hear tools of, uh, so if there are no connections to the the when the uh, water treatment syndicates are lacking subsidies or financing you know, to manage leaks, for example. Leaks is a big issue. We know that there are 30% leakages in our networks, so they lack funds to uh, repair those networks. And they, there's a contradiction in how we manage the use of the least, uh, connections you make, well, the less uh, funding you get. The sanitation budget is for drinking water. So whether you have rainwater or stormwater in the pipe or not, the uh, the income is the same. So uh, the logic here. So the, the basis is drinking water. And so why on drinking water? Logic, you know, rain, uh, uh, drinking water leads to wastewater. So you earn nothing in collecting rainwater. It's funded from the general budget. So we have no obligation to collect uh, stormwater specifically. No intent. There's no obligation. You have the obligation of collecting wastewater, but not 
songwriter. Oops, microphone is off and on. There will be more in the case of people reinfiltrate, like in Bogota, Bogota, or in Cape Town, where they reinfiltrate wastewater uh, at the parcel level, the plot level. In no case, uh, stormwater uh, are part of the funding system or the financial system. No, I'm talking about wastewater when they're domestically treated, as we heard in the example. The idea is that they collect this domestic wastewater and they infiltrate this domestic wastewater in an alternative resource of uh, underground water, uh, recharged by rainwater and treated domestic wastewater. Go back on Cape Town. We had a question on regulations regarding the quality of the recharge water in the aquifers, the quality of the water that is reinfiltrated in, in the ground. Are, are there constraints to that effect uh, uh, when it comes to develop the, the storage uh, endeavors? Yes, so the water quality is, is the water quality is of, uh, of concern, that's right, uh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so that is you know, very closely monitored. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the quality that uh, of the water that you recharge is not so, so that does not make the groundwater worse, worse off. Yeah, so there's pretreatment before it's recharged then. Yeah, so that's the idea. Even this, the, so the wastewater, is treated at the wastewater treatment plant, and and then uh, and then also through the maturation pond and the nature based systems. So also stormwater also through nature based systems. So there's a treatment process that takes place before it's taken to the recharge basins, and and that water quality aspect is is closely monitored. And the idea there is not to make the water quality in the groundwater already there worse off because of this integration process. So the process is definitely closely monitored and, uh, and yeah, uh, and if there are any flags, then they improve the treatment process before they need to be charged. We can say that the issue of uh, reason of uh, uh, wastewater is really a topic with uh, concerns, with uh, questions, especially when we talk about micro pollutants, but I think product projects will be developed in the future okay. to that effect. Were there any other questions on social acceptance of infiltration programs, projects? Uh, that's something that is an issue does that give rise to problems or or no yeah so for cape town yes uh, it uh, is a problem but we notice that uh, normally because of water scarcity because of the, the risk of not having anything at all in, in fact even even the water strategy that i mentioned for cape town that was triggered by the the risk of by the drought that happened been uh, two years ago in Cape Town, and the risk of not having at all. So, like I normally say, uh, a, a, a crisis is an opportunity to change the set ways uh, of, of, the, of the community. So, for us, uh, to because the, the issues of sustainable boundary systems and integrated stormwater management have, have always been uh, uh, research items, and we've been promoting this for very many years here, but they have not been well received until the drought happened. And that, would be, that was the trigger to realize, oh, okay, this is a water scarce country. We need to then diversify and go into these alternative sources. So that helps with the perception. Otherwise, if there's plenty, people will always say, no, this is not what we want. But if there's a risk for not having at all a crisis of water scarcity and drought, then that definitely plays into the changes in perception and acceptability of some, some of these alternative sources. Leo, peut-être une question? Leo, a question, maybe? Uh, yes, I have another question for uh, Stefan. And I was just wondering um, the costs related to the planning. I know that the because it's a law that um, the the owner or the project developer needs to um, needs to needs to have, uh, implement these measures, so there's no way they can avoid them. 
but I wanted to ask um, the costs. Do you know if they're like how um, com compared to the traditional system? Um, after how many years um, these costs are already? Um, how do you say? Um, uh, um, like yes, I think you understand me. <laughs> It's no problem. Um, yeah, in, in this special case, it was that the investor actually made advertising that he has a very special sustainable uh, um, project and uh, we didn't even uh, had to make uh, um, suggestions to do so. Um, they made them by themselves. Uh, there was also uh, thinking about using this water, the gray water, reuse of stormwater. This is still in discussion. I didn't mention it because it, it's not sure it will come. Um, so there would be a benefit also. Uh, it's still possible because the, the uh, planning is not in a stage where it's finished already. Um, but but it's true. Certainly, the uh, the green roofs and the storages will cost money. This is out of a question. In Germany, we have, have um, a fee for um, stormwater uh, when it's uh, um, uh, flowing to the stormwater system, and uh, so <clears throat> this certainly will um, be uh, saved because all the water is infiltrating. And then in, in some um, places, um, they also get some, some uh, support by programs to, uh, to, to get money uh, for it. But yes, uh, um, certainly, I'm, I'm sure it, it, um, it will cost more money uh, compared uh, to uh, the conditions uh, 20 years ago, where it was uh, free just to, to uh, let the water into adjacent a stormwater system. But in general, it, it's for Berlin, especially uh, in, in some areas, it's not allowed to um, get any stormwater in the stormwater system anymore because it's completely overloaded and um, they uh, have no chance but to, to treat the, the stormwater completely on the property. Uh, the maximum which is allowed is uh, two liter per second and hectare if there is no chance and you need um, um, a special report by some some um, experts that it is not possible um, to keep the complete stormwater on the property. Only then you are allowed um, to to uh, let the water into receiving water. And that depends on the type of um, the receiving water. Is it a big river or is it groundwater that's also uh, taken into, uh, into consideration? Okay, thank you. I'd like to react to the cost and funds and finance in France. There's been controversies for about 25 years about the fight uh, over there would be a uh, river tax, uh, rain due tax. Well, it lasted for two years. It was so limited that it cost more to implement it than to actually gain the money. So uh, it started, it lasted two years, then it was removed. So we don't have any specific funding for rainwater collection, but we got the same constraints, uh, like prohibition and limitation of connect to connections to sewage systems. And we did uh, comparative studies, and sometimes it is cheaper to do nature-based solutions than to actually run operation with pipes and technical uh, decantation infusion ponds. So we end up with costs which are lower by investing in uh, operation between uh, works which are more better I just forgot that that certainly if there is no uh, implementation of SATs, there needs to be done any other measures like like a, a central uh, retention basin, and there is no room for it. So they are happy to have these solutions, and uh, um, because otherwise it, it would look uh, completely different. So that the question of 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 costs really is not a matter of fact because they can realize that uh, uh, in the way they want to do it. Merci beaucoup. J'avais aussi une autre question concernant... Uh... There is another question with, concerning this type of project. Could, could it be possible? Can you consider to apply similar projects 
at the scale of a city or for districts in the all districts of cities where they are higher density of urban construction so and surface you know are less available there is less surface available for such works so how do you adapt this kind of uh, project or work uh, yes yes you're right uh, it's certainly more difficult in existing areas um, but we developed some methods um, how we can disconnect um, uh, existing uh, stormwater um, uh, areas from the uh, stormwater system and certainly uh, there there are uh, they are depending on the local conditions and uh, we um, establish maps that uh, I suggest to disconnect maybe 10% or 30% or 50% from the city, depending on the area and depending on the available green area we have. So uh, there are methods how to deal with it also in existing areas, but certainly this is in general more expensive because you have to change infrastructure. But especially when it comes to areas where changes are needed anywhere, anyway, uh, um, and and they will rebuild some 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 areas. Uh, we um, yes uh, recommend strongly that you take uh, uh, stormwater management into consideration, and uh, that is possible, but often not done because it's not in the mind of engineering or also city development uh, uh, managers. But but. Uh, Yes, we we have to to uh, um, support it by by universities, by politicians everywhere to tell them, okay, take uh, uh, stormwater management into consideration uh, as uh, in a very early stage. Then it's all possible. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's already six in France. Um, we will end now this webinar and...